We have Lisa Dancing Light and Maggie Freaky uh, with us today, and they are presenting on the release of Magic Mountain. So like I said, today we are presenting Magic Mountain by Lisa Dancing Light. It is illustrated by Maggie Freak, and they're both with, with us today to talk about the process of writing the book and to tell us the story. Before we get into it, we do have two communication options through our Zoom today. We have the chat available. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them in there. If you have any technical issues, uh, you can communicate with me through the chat as well. We also have a Q&A. So if you have a question you would like uh, either Lisa or Maggie to answer today, just put it into the Q&A and we'll visit it at the end of the presentation. With that, we are ready to begin. Lisa, I'll hand it over right to you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you for your wonderful command of technology. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be able to celebrate. Happy Earth Day, everybody. We're celebrating the beauty of the Earth and all the gifts that we get from her. And um, it's a beautiful day to just honor that, that special time. So I'm very honored to be able to be the guest panelist today to share about a song and story of Magic Mountain. And I'm very happy that Maggie Fricky could join us today too. So Maggie, thank you for being available. Uh, Magic would not be the entity that he is if it weren't for your creative artistry. Oh, and, thank uh, you. Your ability to really have a special way of listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will tell a little bit of the backstory of Magic Mountain, and it is a long one, and I know we only have an hour today, so I will keep it brief. Magic Mountain actually started in 1981, believe it or not, when I was teaching preschool, when one of my sons was in preschool, and I wrote a song called Magic Mountain. I don't remember too much about it because that was a long time ago, but I archive all of the songs that I've written. So I have that and I have the date. And then 10 years later, I was teaching music at Colorado Rocky Mountain School. And I was asked to write an environmental music event and a, a curriculum for the preschool there. And so I blended that experience of the Magic Mountain song, which kind of had a leaning towards environmental message and we created this play and uh, Channel 4 from Denver came over and filmed it. It was quite fun. Um, there was a huge mountain. The story about Magic Mountain is that he's a mountain that talks and he quits talking because people quit coming to hear his stories, which is sad. But a little boy and girl come camping with their parents in the Valley of Magic Mountain and they hear about him from a wise old owl and they decide to journey up Magic Mountain to see if they can awaken him to hear his stories. So in the play, a, the big mountain was made out of fabric by Mary Noon, who's a well-known artist in Glenwood Springs and the mountain talked which is really, really special. So that was a bit of the backstory of how that all, that part all came. And we did have a, uh, uh, Debbie Candelo, who was the director of the preschool at the time, had received a grant from the Carbondale Arts Council. Uh, Thomas Lawley was the director at the time. And so they were the funds behind that project that was the seed for that. It's that little bird again. Mm -hmm. So uh, fast forward, um, about that same time I was studying with some wisdom teachers, um, many different wisdom teachers and several of them were of different cultural influences like Wallace Black Elk, who was a Lakota elder, Brooke Medicine Eagle, who was a medicine keeper and Maladoma Somme, who was a West African author and spiritual teacher and studying with them helped deepen my understanding of the sacredness of the earth. And I became just obsessed with sharing that with everybody, quite frankly. It also uh, deepened my understanding of why it was important to protect our environment, especially for seven generations to come. Um, I learned much more about the wilderness and had deeper appreciation just as a hiker and a camper. And um, I was guiding 
organizations in the backcountry on land journeys. And so I took all of this, all of these experiences, along with my hiking experiences. And my big inspiration for this book is, um, I don't know how many of you actually live in the valley, but the big inspiration for Magic Mountain is our beautiful icon and sentinel in this Crystal River Valley, which is called Mount Sopras. And I have hiked the top of Mount Sopras many times. It's almost 13,000 feet high. And um, it's, it's interesting because it's a, it's a joy and it's a struggle. It's exhilarating and it's hard, kind of like life. And I think the lessons from that were, were part of, of the story as well, because I've lived at the base of that mountain for over 40 years. So I have a relationship with it and I've watched changes. So um, the, the basic message here of Magic Mountain um, is in the story, which you will hear soon, is to not go to sleep, to stay awake, to have a special way of listening, which is super important for me as a Suzuki piano teacher, and uh, also to appreciate the beauty of our environment in a changing world because it's changing regardless of whether we want it to or not. So we need to have a definite appreciation and pay attention. So um, there's a great foundation underneath this for sure. And the more recent sharing was uh, what brought it more forward for me was a couple of years ago. I was reading the story to my granddaughter's Montessori preschool in Salt Lake City. And the director there said she could write a whole semester curriculum off of this little book. And I thought, wow, this story is still valid after 30 years. That's interesting. So that planted the seed for me to um, create these resources and develop this project into what it is today. So um, Magic Mountain is more than just a, a, a children's book, really. It's an educational resource. And it has a lot of information in the back. There's also on my website, a download for the curriculum, which is available for free right now. And the curriculum goes with the book with art and music and an outdoor explorer program. So for all of you parents who are homeschoolers and Holly, I know you're in there listening right now. You're one of the homeschooling parents that's test driving the curriculum for me and on my advisory board. So thank you for that. So we're developing that right now. And then there will also be Magic Mountain, the musical, puzzles and a board game for different ages and learning styles. So there's a lot in development now to come. So Maggie, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah. So should I read the story first or should we talk to Maggie about how she did the art or what would you like to do, Alex? Let's talk a little bit about the illustration. Okay. Maggie, what could you tell us about it? What was the process when Lisa reached out to you? Uh, just tell us the story about that. Well, it was uh, kind of a, a, a real nice meeting I had with Lisa over the phone. We talked for like two hours and uh, she told me about Magic Mountain and we decided to uh, develop the characters first because you know you can't have the book without characters. So. Um, I did some sketches of um, what I thought the characters, um, what I thought Lisa wanted. So um, uh, would you say, Lisa, that's pretty much how it happened? It was exactly, you gave me your concept and I said, oh, I really like this. Can you change that a little bit? It, it was it was a really interesting process because uh, I was trying to impart to you, Maggie, what was in my mind that I had very feeble attempts at sketching. I created a PowerPoint presentation to go with the text, how I saw the book laying out because I'm a very tactile hands-on person. And I, I don't just organize in my head, I have to have form to work with. And so I sent Maggie the PowerPoint to show her these little tiny, I'm real good at drawing stick figures as a yoga teacher, <laughs> but not so great at drawing art. So she would take my ideas and then come back with her concept. So we really developed from concepts. And actually, Maggie was great because she's really into clothes. And, you know, 
being a personal stylist and all that, I think um, uh, dressing the kids was really fun. Like, what, was. what would you imagine a kid wearing if they were camping, you know? <laughs> so that was it super was, fun. It was such a great experience. And I, I can't wait to uh, draw the boy and the girl and magic um, and uh, continue this um, wonderful story that Lisa's created. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Did we want to get into the story? Sure, why not? And then we'll sing, all right? <laughs> so this is, just so you know, there's two forms of Magic Mountain right now. There's the hard copy, and then there's the soft cover. And so they're both available at lisadancinglight.com. And then Alex and I are brainstorming if, about having a translation done in Spanish. So that may be a summer project. And uh, so right now, I'm hoping that there's translation going on that um, everyone's able to understand. So for right now, this is in English. So this is a song and story of Magic Mountain. And this reading is dedicated to my grandchildren, Veda, Lydia, and Mason. Once upon a time, in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, there was a very special mountain. This was not your average mountain. No, it was very tall and very big, and it was very beautiful. And it was magical. Do you know why it was a magic mountain? because this mountain was very different from all other mountains. This mountain could talk. Long, long ago, before cars or airplanes or video games, everyone lived peacefully beneath the shadow of Magic Mountain. Elk, deer, mountain lions, bighorn sheep, bears and rabbits, all the animals would roam freely. Trees covered the lush green mountainsides and fish swam deep in the icy blue, crystal clear waters of the high alpine lakes. The air was filled with the sweet song of birds. When they migrated south for the winter, skies would darken for days with millions of birds. Life was in balance here. There was a peaceful harmony among all things. Do you know why? The people that lived in the village beneath Magic Mountain were very special people and they had a special way of listening. They would journey up to Magic Mountain, who they called Magic, and sit for days listening to his stories. Magic loved to tell his stories. He was very wise. He had seen many things and he knew the secrets of the earth. He knew this was sacred ground. Life was simple. These stories were told to many generations. Night times were filled with families and friends telling great stories around glowing campfires. You see, they had no TVs back then. Magic was so happy to tell his stories. But as time passed, people moved away. Towns were built nearby and animals began to disappear. Soon, no one came to see Magic Mountain. He became sad and lonely because he thought no one cared anymore about his stories. 
So he stopped talking and he went to sleep. As years passed, things changed in the Valley of Magic Mountain. Many trees had fallen in the winter from the destructive avalanches or were cut for new homes or for firewood for the people settling there. Roads were built right on the slopes of Magic himself. Since most of the trees were gone, the birds that once filled the air with their sweet songs were gone too. The streams that were once home to many fish were now almost empty from all of the fishermen camping nearby and the riverbanks were littered with trash. The oozles, also known as the American dippers, who made their nests nearby, had also disappeared. One beautiful autumn day, a young boy and his sister came to camp with their family in the shadow of Magic Mountain. They have been coming here since they were very small, but this time they could see things looked different. They also had a very special way of listening. Late one night, after everyone had snuggled warmly in their sleeping bags, the little boy heard a noise. Ooh, ooh. He thought it sounded like an owl. Hey, wake up, he said to his sister. She sat up quickly, rubbing her eyes. I hear an owl outside. Let's go check it out. They grabbed their flashlights and quietly slipped out of their tent, trying not to wake their parents. They tiptoed gently towards the sound and in the soft light of the harvest moon, they stopped suddenly and couldn't believe their eyes. Good evening said the wise old owl perched high in a gnarly tree branch. Good evening, Mr. Owl, said the little boy. Hello, said the little girl. The owl looked at them curiously and they looked at the owl. Then the owl asked, do you know the story of Magic Mountain? No they said in unison. So they sat right under that tree branch and listened to every word the owl spoke of the history of Magic Mountain. The warm night passed quickly. After several hours, they noticed a pink glow in the eastern sky. They realized they should get back to their tent so their parents would not worry. We better be going now, said the boy. Goodbye, said the owl. Thank you for your stories, said the girl. The boy and girl were so excited, they ran all the way back to their campsite. They woke up their mother and father and told them the stories of Magic Mountain and of the wise old owl. Even though their story sounded pretty unbelievable, their mother and father knew their children had a special way of listening. They even remembered when they were young and heard unusual things too. They understood wanting to find the owl and go journey up Magic Mountain. You see, the boy and girl had been hiking with their parents since they were very young and they knew about being in the wilderness. The boy and girl packed some fruit, some cheese, some nuts and water in their backpacks 
and said goodbye to their parents and began their trek up Magic Mountain. The mountain was very tall and the hike was very difficult. They walked and walked until they could see the mountain peak where they sat down to rest. After they ate their snack of apples and nuts and cheese and drank some water, the boy looked up at the mountain and hollered, Oh, great mountain, we have come to hear your stories. Please wake up. But there was nothing but the silence and a few birds pecking at a nearby tree trunk. Then the little girl stood and called out, Oh, great mountain, can you hear us? We've come to hear your stories. Please, please wake up. Magic is just snoring away. Now, Magic had been asleep for many, many, many years and no one had come to wake him. As his eyes opened, there was a deep rumble in the earth. And the boy and girl looked at each other and began to run. Then Magic opened his mouth and said, My friends, it is good to have you here to listen to my stories. He looked around at all that had changed while he was asleep. He saw the trees that had been cut down and could no longer hear the birds singing that once lived in those trees. He saw the roads that had been carved right on his slopes. Things were definitely looking out of balance. He was shocked and sad. Please sit down and I will tell you a story, he said. It looks like people here have forgotten my stories. So the boy and girl sat down and they listened attentively to every word that Magic said. After Magic told them many stories, they thanked him and promised to come back for another visit. Racing down the mountain trail, they could hardly wait to tell their parents and their friends these stories. But they wondered, would anyone else be able to listen and to hear these stories? What about you? Can you hear magic stories? Do you have a special way of listening? So that's where I'm going to leave you with the story right now. And we're going to have a song for Magic Mountain and see if we can have him talk to us. So I'm going to teach you the chorus of the song, which is super simple. And it goes like this. Tell me Magic Mountain. Tell me Magic Mountain. That's it. Can you do that? I hope so. Okay, so here we go. We're starting at the beginning. Can you tell me, Magic Mountain, how many rainbows 
website at lisadancinglight.com and it's right there at the top and all of Maggie's beautiful art is paired with the song and so you can learn that song so that when you get your book and has the words in it you can sing along with me. Thank you. Excellent. That was really great. You can hear me fine, right Lisa? Yes, I can. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, and welcome. thank you everybody for singing along. Now I'd like to take some time to take questions. If anybody watching us today has a question for Lisa or for Maggie, feel free to type it in the chat or put it into our Q&A uh, at any time. But if you give me a second, I will begin with the first question. Oh, we do have one from the chat coming in. David asks, where did Lisa get her music background? That's a good question. Should I talk into the microphone or is just talking to you good like this? We, we can hear you. Okay. Um, it's, it goes way long time ago, David. That's a good question. I have been singing since I was three. I used to have a little yellow plastic record player and little cardboard records that I sang along with that a lot of Disney songs and oh my gosh. Yeah, I've been in love with music for a long time. I started studying piano at the age of eight. Um, I think I always envied anyone that could sing because I, I just love to sing. And I majored in music in college and I have a degree in music education. And I've been a professional singer and songwriter for 40 years. And so it, the journey just keeps going on and on. But it, it really started with having a little yellow plastic record player <laughs> and, pla and cardboard records. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we do have a, another question from Lisa. How long did it take to write the book? Ooh, from beginning to end of the project, that's a good question. Um, I actually, I don't know, Maggie, when did I reach out to you? It was in the fall, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the writing of the story actually has been a work in progress for 30 years, but the illustration with Maggie and putting it together in fixed form, I would say six or seven months. Mm -hmm. when, and, and to follow up on that, um, so how did Lisa and Maggie, how did you guys meet? So going on with you, um, reaching out to her for the illustrations, if you could tell us the story, uh, Rita asked, how did Lisa and Maggie meet? Huh? Well, Maggie and I actually haven't met in person yet. <laughs> um, Light of the Moon, who is the team of people that helped me publish this book, Alyssa Almacht, Kayla Henley and Olivia Savard. They're a local company. And Maggie's father was writing a book, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong, Maggie. And uh -huh. he was in the office with them in a meeting and said, well, my daughter is an artist and an illustrator. 
Alyssa contacted me, I contacted Maggie, looked at her work and I said, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, Maggie, what do you remember? That's pretty much it. Uh, you know, um, Elisa had, uh, he, Elisa and my father had talked a lot because um, he was uh, publishing his book, America's New Revolution. And uh, he said, well, you know, let me go ahead and email you some uh, paintings that my daughter has done and see if you can use those in any aspect of your publishing business. And so um, thanks to Elisa, I, I think we got an email like the next day. It's, it's just so neat how boom, boom, boom. It just, you know, happened just like that. Great, thank you. Um, going back to the book, uh, Holly asks, if you have a favorite page, and I'll, I'll actually ask both of you this question. So Lisa, what is your favorite page of the book? That's a good question because I'm looking at having puzzles made and there's several that really call to me for different reasons. I don't have just one favorite, but I love this one with all the animals in it because there's a lot of symbolism here for me personally. And Maggie pulled in all those parts. Uh, ducks are very special because I have an irrigation ditch that have ducks swimming on it right now. And she put the ducks in there for me and the, I'm, the bear is very special to me. So I love that page. This one is one of my favorites. I just love the colors of the camping scene. It's just beautiful. Um, so I'll probably have puzzles made of both of those. And then this one, well, the boy with the flashlight, of course, in the tent, but this one with the owl, I love this one. There's just something about it. It's just, I don't know. Maggie, I have a hard time choosing. What about you? You know, um, I'm I'm with you on the one with the bears climbing the tree and the, the all of the animals. Um, this one was one of my favorites with the, the wagon. Uh, just because, you know, um, anybody who knows me, I love antiquity and, um, you know, I, I grew up with antiques and, um, I um, had just watched um, A Woman Walks Ahead. I don't know if you've all seen that movie. It's it's incredible with uh, Jessica um, Chastain and um, uh, Michael Gray Eyes. But uh, it was the story of Sitting Bull. And um, sh uh, this uh, Catherine Weldon went to go paint him. And uh, this is um, my inspiration from, that was the inspiration for this one. So this is one of my favorites. I love that one too. Like I said, I can't pick one. <laughs> I love and I love the last one with the rainbow. Uh, you know, it's, I love them all. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. It's amazing. Um, so now I have a question for you, Lisa, and it's pretty general, but you touched on it a little bit. But I'd like to know what inspired you to write Magic Mountain. That's a really great question, Alex. I, I'm a mom, also a grandma. I'm also an educator and a musician. So there's all of those aspects come into this experience with Magic Mountain. So I love to share. I love to tell stories. Um, I love gardening and I'm very connected to the earth. I'm a master gardener and gardening is really important. And I learned that from my mother. And I think that's really important to pass on to generations is the wisdom of the earth, growing food, understanding uh, what, what's in our area, you know, the flora and the fauna. Um, I've hiked a lot. I've done a lot of hiking and camping with my family. And we've spent a lot of time hiking as families, even with my grandkids. I think it's the love of nature probably inspired that and just the challenges of getting, you know, getting out and hiking like to the top of Mount Sopris and the lessons. I mean, there's some tough lessons sometimes. I've never had any drama, thank goodness. Um, in Montana, I did have a bear try to get my tent. That was interesting. But I mean, it's nature. Nature is just the best teacher. And I think that was what inspired me. And, and, I think nature is just one of the best teachers and the experience of being in, in nature, in the wilderness. 
Awesome. And what kind of message do you would you like to see spread from the story uh, as it pertains to the environment and nature? What, what do you want people to take away with them from reading or listening? That's a great question. I think uh, with all that I've seen still unfolding with the fourth school movement and kids being called to be out in nature more, I know the Aspen Institute has got programs going and there is a forest school movement. My granddaughter goes to a forest school, so she's in nature all day, whether it's raining or 20 below or whatever. It's a great teacher. And so I think the message is to immerse ourselves in nature as much as possible. Um, we're not gonna get sick being out there. We're gonna be healthy and uh, we're gonna learn and we're gonna have develop a special way of listening because you have to listen and pay attention when you're in nature. Um, it, depending on what geographical location you're in. If you're in the desert in Arizona, there's little prickly cactus and snakes and stuff. And uh, you know, there's just a great, a great teacher there in nature. So have listening, paying attention, staying curious and telling stories. We really need to tell our stories and our experiences because sharing those are what connect us together uh, in families, in friendships and in communities. Excellent. Um, I have Tom with a question here as well. And uh, let me read it to you. Are you interested in visiting elementary schools as a musician and an author to promote music education and writing along with the environmental impact? Absolutely. I've, I've uh, done that off and on for the last 40 years that I've been teaching. So um, absolutely, please get in touch with me through my website. I would love to talk to you. Um, I have... Uh, through the program, when I taught at Aspen Community School, we always did collaborative programs and events, and they were very much centered around the environment. Uh, the same with the Montessori School here in Carbondale, the same with Colorado Rocky Mountain School. Um, all of those schools very connected with the environment. And so I'm very interested in sharing that message in whatever way can connect with, with kids and, and bring them some joy and help them learn. The curriculum's great. You can download the curriculum if you want to and start to work with that. So it's a starting point. Great, thank you. Yeah. I have a question for both of you. Is I thought that the illustrations were very unique. I, I don't think I've seen a style like that before. And I wanted to know how you both felt that the style of the illustrations fit the story and the characters. And if you could take turns answering that for me in your own way. Um, Maggie, do you want to go first? Oh, okay. Do you have an, a, a thought? You, you know, it's really um, funny. Um, uh, I, I've actually done two other children's books that were not published, and that was such a bummer. Um, but you know, um, you know, I, I, I got paid for them, but uh, you know, they never, they never took them to the publisher. And that was, I think I've always been kind of geared to do something that I, I actually have um, an artist friend named Alex Graham. And uh, he said that um, my style of painting is very um, innocent and um, it conveys happiness. And uh, he said it, it really be suited for uh, children's books. And I said, yeah, I, I would love another opportunity to do another children's book. And um, lo and behold, this opportunity came up and you know, I, I said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I've lost audio to Maggie somehow. I don't know. Maggie, can you hear me? I sure can. And so somehow I've lost audio for you. I don't know why. Um, so I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Um, so can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. So um, Maggie talked about how her style of painting kind of focuses on innocence and happiness. And, and she thought that that would fit the story. That was... That was the, the basic of it. So when we first started the conceptual process 
with the art, there were a couple of things that entered into my conscious awareness. And because of the situations going on right now in communities culturally, I became aware as I would read some of the books from my childhood and some of my granddaughter's books even, they're very often focused on a certain specific um, skin tone, hair color. Uh, you know, there's a lot of not to knock the Disney princess thing because everybody loves those princesses. I did too, I do too. But I wanted to have something that reflected something that was more earthy and Maggie really nailed it. And I wanted to have a, a children and a family that didn't really express one definite um, ethnic background. I wanted to have it be more open and more broad. So rather than having it, and, and no offense, Maggie, I love your blonde hair. But <laughs> I, I didn't want the blonde hair, blue eyed little girl and, you know, I wanted to have something be a little bit more diverse. And you did a fabulous job of creating that. And even to the hairstyle, somebody has commented on your braids, how intricate the braids were in the little girl. And, you know, I just put myself in little kids, if they're camping, you know, they're not going to have a perfect hairdo. Little girls are probably going to have their hair braided because the mom's not going to want to brush the hair, you know. <laughs> And they're going to have a baseball cap on. So the art and the characters developed kind of organically through culturally what has been going on with the unrest in our environment. I had an awareness to that. I had an awareness to gender issues. And um, I, I just had an awareness and I didn't know quite how to express this, but I, I feel like Maggie really addressed that. And Maggie, I don't know if you said anything about that. So I apologize because I just, I couldn't hear you talking. <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, and I have one last question. Um, so how did you decide that the story should be a song? Was it something that you, that was kind of born together, story and song, or was it one, one before the other? Alex, that is a, that I, the only answer I can give you is that the song came from what I can remember back in 1981. And I don't remember the inspiration if that that had a story behind it. Like I said, I was living at the shadow of Magic Mountain myself. So I'm sure I had some inspiration there. Um, but I feel like this, this story just kind of grew from my imagination. And I really sit and meditate on that mountain a lot. I used to go up Prince Creek Road, which was also called Dinkle Lake Road. And I just go sit on rocks and just look at it. And I think the mountain would literally just kind of tell me the story. I, I don't know. The answer is, I think the song came first and the story evolved out of it. <laughs> well, um, we're almost to the end. So if our participants have any more questions, you still have a few minutes to ask them. But as a parting question, I guess I'd like to ask what's next for the both of you. Well, I can say what's next for me and what I hope is next for Maggie. <laughs> and then she can say, mm -hmm. I would like to do the uh, translation for the book in, an, in, the, uh, in another language and, um, and then have someone record the song in, Espanol. And I would like to finish the workbook and the curriculum and have that done in a spiral form. So it's available in a usable format for teachers, classroom teachers and um, homeschooling parents. So that workbook, color book, um, curriculum will all be one project that will be completed hopefully by this, this summer, end of summer. And then I am working on the puzzles, getting the puzzles printed, and I'm working on the musical. Uh, Pam Rosenthal, who's a local musician, is teaching at Waldorf School and would like to use some of that music with her um, after school program, I believe. And so I'm working on getting that done because yeah. I had some interest in that. So getting the music published and all that together. So. Excellent. And how about you, Maggie? 
Well, um, she, uh, Lisa actually mentioned a, a coloring book uh, to me and I got excited uh, with that. So um, I've been doing some sketches um, in between my paintings and um, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. So. <laughs> great. Well, thank you. This was very, very nice and really cool to see. I, I really appreciate uh, all the work you did, Lisa, and all the work you did, Maggie. And thank you so much for joining us today and, and presenting. And thank you, everybody who came to see. This will be recorded and posted on the library's Facebook and YouTube for about a couple of weeks after it's ready. Uh, and you can visit it and share it with more people. And hopefully uh, in the near future, uh, when we have the, the Spanish translation ready, we'll, we'll host another event to uh, present the, the Spanish version. And if there's any last words, uh, Lisa or Maggie, you'd like to give us before we end our session today. I like that idea of a series of cards. That's a cool idea. Did you see that, Alex and yeah. Maggie? Cool. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think I'm going to do a Magic Mountain pillow, like a bedtime pillow with Magic Mountain on it. I just had that idea. So I, I have Magic Mountain coffee cups, you know, all mm -hmm. sorts of cool things. <laughs> All right, well, very cool. Um, it was very nice to have you again and I look forward to everything else that's coming. Thank you so much, Alex. It's been wonderful being a guest and I'm so happy that we got to have Maggie be with us too. Maggie, I can't wait to meet you in person. Yes, yes, that'll happen very soon. <laughs> oh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored. Thank you. We'll do it again soon, I hope. Well, with that, we'll, we've reached the end and thank you so much. Once the video is ready, Lisa and Maggie, I'll, I'll have that sent to you. And everybody who came and watched, keep your eye on the library's Facebook and the video should appear there um, in a couple of weeks at, at most. And maybe we can do a book signing someday at one of the libraries. We hope so, sometime soon. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. And thank you so much for attending. And happy Earth Day. Happy, happy Earth, Earth Day. Day. Yes. <laughs>